That was great. We are not live. We are alive though. Hello, lovely people. Hello, little Gary. Hello, the ridiculous. I'm going to let you into a secret, YouTuber. We just did about 10 minutes and then I realized I hadn't recorded this video. So if we are coming in a bit giddy, that's what's happened. Anyway, today we are going to be not only manipulating time by going back in time, but we're going to be manipulating fabric, uh, which means, of course, we're going to be creating texture. And the wonderful Nicholas Ball, full text builder there, is bringing us a texture today. <laughs> Hello. So lovely Nicholas, lovely Gary, lovely YouTuber. Please do give us a like, give us a thumbs up, hit the bell, uh, leave us a comment. We would love to hear you because it really does help us in the algorithm. And there may be someone who is sitting there thinking, oh, I wish Nicholas Ball was on YouTube. Well, he is, and you can let someone know about it by hitting that thumbs up. Honestly, it works. Uh, so, of course, if you want to go straight into the manipulation of fabric, you see that, you see how loose I am with that, that manipulation of fabric, probably not going to happen at all, um, then you can go straight to the exercise because the time code is below. However, if you want to stick around and find out a little bit more about Nicholas, then please do. So, hello, lovely Nicholas. I'm going to ask you hello. a Hello, a very leading question. Who is Nicholas Ball? Oh, the eternal question. Well, um, Nicholas Ball is a quilter from Cardiff, South Wales, and I have been quilting for approximately 12 years now. And I think like most people, when you start a new creative endeavour, I began in a very traditional place. So I would follow patterns, specific instructions, and make quilts that kind of looked like what they did on the pattern cover. And after that, I quickly realized that my brain doesn't really work in that way. I prefer a bit more of a freer approach to my creativity. So it involves a very convoluted story um, concerning cabbages, which I know some of these lovely YouTubers may have already heard. And you, Rachel, certainly have heard the story of how I began improv quilting. Um, but essentially I was inspired by an unusual, unusual source and began experimenting with more organic liberated piecing and I did this about two years into my quilting journey and have been working in that way ever since so I like to look around take inspiration from the natural world and rather than follow a very regimented set of instructions work in a much more freer looser way I think that uh, that makes me happiest when I'm being a little bit loose with my creativity so uh, yeah that is Nicholas Ball a little bit well, loose we should do it great Rachel I know. Hey. I'm just shake it out. Just shake oh, it out. Oh, now we're going Taylor Swift. Shake it up. We we'll shake it up. Ah, the yes, soundtrack. I, I like that looser thing. I like it. Um, Gary, what do you feel about having your your fellow male stitcher with you? Because there aren't many in this industry. No, there's not. Thank you. So excited. And Nicholas, I just want to ask you. You know, when did your journey into stitching start? I mean, I know when I started, but I'm just really curious to know about you, really, and when it all started. Tell me. I will, yes. So um, even though I've been quilting for 12 years, that really wasn't the beginning of my uh, sort of stitching journey or even my creativity. So from a very young age, I was very creative. Um, I wouldn't say I came from an extremely creative family, but my father was a wooden machinist. He was into carpentry. So I would sort of follow him around and pick up old bits of wood and glue them together and things like that. And then in terms of textiles and stitch, my grandmother, who wasn't a quilter herself, but she showed me embroidery, cross stitch. It was actually her that taught me how to thread a needle. We would do tapestry kits together. We would uh, knit soft toys. Um, she would show me sort of um, how to separate floss, things like that. So I learned a lot from her and she sort of instilled in me that joy of creating with with my hands. So that creativity has always been there. Um, it took a little bit of a, a sort of a turn as I got to sort of A-level and university. I actually studied photography in university um, and that was sort of the career that I envisaged for myself. I was going to be a, a fashion photographer. That was the goal. Travel the world, shoot the cover of Vogue and Days and Confused and all of these high-end fashion magazines. Um, and then just ended up traveling for a while after university. The photography didn't really kick off. Um, so came back to the UK, a little bit disillusioned. And it was then when I bought my first sewing machine and all of that love of sort of textiles and fabric and thread that I learned from my grandmother sort of came right back to the fore then. And I just started quilting from patterns and the rest is history, as they say. 
So did the quilting start as a, just as a hobby? Did you see quilting as a career or was it something you just scurried away into the attic and were sewing because it made you feel better? Yeah, absolutely. So very much at the beginning, I never imagined that I would, you know, 10, 12 years down the line, be teaching it, writing about it, talking about it. At that time, it was very much just a creative outlet. I wanted something that was different from photography, uh, something that was as far removed from photography, really, uh, as you could get. And the campus where I did my degree was, um, it was an art college. So there were lots of disciplines. There was ceramics, there was photography, there was textiles. And our sort of darkroom area was next to the textile workshops. So walking to and from lectures, I would kind of see in the corner of my eye all this amazing textile work, fabric manipulation, dyeing, weaving, knitting. Um, so I think somewhere in the back of my mind, there was a little bit of a seed planted um, for a sort of an exploration in textiles. And also growing up, I was a huge fan, or still am, of um, American TV shows, films. And I'm not sure if you've ever noticed, but there are generally lots of quilts that decorate sets in American serial dramas, TV shows, comedies. And once you notice them, they're very hard to unnotice. I mean, I see them almost in every film that, that I watch. There's one on the bed, there's one on the back of the sofa, there's sometimes on the wall. Um, so they've always kind of been a part of my consciousness quilting. And I, as I said, bought a sewing machine and just wanted to make a quilt. I don't know what the determining factor was to, to, to want to make a quilt. I mean, it could have very easily have been, I want to make a, a shirt for myself or you know, something, something other than a utilitarian object. Um, so it was, yeah, it kind of came out of nowhere, but I think somewhere in the back of my mind, something was ignited um, and I just got bitten by that quilting bug and became very obsessed, let's say, with it and just sort of explored it in as many different ways as I could really. I must ask, Ashley, you know, going out sourcing your fabrics, and a guy in a fabric shop, did you notice, and this is what I've noticed, that they go over to you straight away, like you don't know what you're looking for. Uh, can yeah. I help you? You know, do yeah. you know what you're doing here? <laughs> I've had definitely had that experience. I mean, there is one quilt shop I recall very vividly that in the corner of, there was a seat with a sign attached to the back of it, and it said, husbands wait here. So... <laughs> You know, that kind of immediately puts you off if you are um, a male quilter in, in a very female dominated industry. And I remember once I'd gone into a sewing machine shop, which we shall uh, remain nameless, but I wanted my sewing machine serviced. And the lady behind the counter was very sort of, well, have you tried this? And have you tried this? And I said, yes, you know, I have tried all of these things, but it's still sort of doing some irregularities. So I really just want it serviced, you know, get a mechanic in there, deep clean it, all of this sort of stuff. And she was there very adamant that, you know, you should change the needle as if I didn't know what I was doing. And to the left of the counter was a pile of quilting magazines. Um, and it just so happened that the topmost one had my quilt on the cover. So I looked at her and I went, oh, no, you know, I am quite experienced. Um, I made that pointing to the quilt. And she took that to mean that I would bought the magazine, I'd followed the pattern and that I'd made a version of that quilt. And she went, oh, yes, well, that, that's very good. And I think I was like, well, I don't think you understand. I made that. That is my design. And I flicked through the uh, magazine to where the quilt was. And of course, there's a picture of the creator and I held it up and I was like, look, see, it's me. Um, and then she very quickly changed her attitude towards me. <laughs> so much so that I walked out with a goodie bag of things like pins and um, tape measures and a pair of scissors, I think, and even maybe some fabric because, you know, she was so sort of embarrassed, I think, that she'd just assumed that a man wouldn't yeah. know anything about sewing machines or quilting in general so yes I have had experiences of that sort of thing definitely yeah absolutely that's so interesting because you know you think you know we talk about sex as well and quite often we think being sex is against a woman but I and, and you you know experience that it's not you know it's not maybe it's not direct but there is an assumption that you perhaps don't know about sewing and about these things it's uh, really interesting I just I'm so pleased that in fact I'm not the only one to have that experience <laughs> no, no no I'm sure there's many of us and I think you know most of it comes from a place of you know of innocence I don't think there's any malice there it's just that people no. aren't you know the, the vast majority of people who quilt are ladies of a certain demographic of a certain age 
and you know stereotypes stick unfortunately and people will exactly. think that quilting equates uh women um but, but of know, course as we know there are there are lots of us it's not and it's engineering it is going back to your father being the carpenter you were watching him put pieces together and how they had to fit tightly together that's what you do with putting your quilts together yeah it's exactly, exactly the same i know about prejudices in the world but i never thought it existed in sewing shops um in all seriousness no, though i do have a new theme tune for you now nicholas uh which is the um dim, dim, dim. <laughs> pretty woman because that reminds me of that scene when Julie Roberts, <laughs> Roberts walks back in dressed up to the nines and goes a big mistake a big mistake because they didn't listen to her in the first place and then she goes do you know who I am <laughs> that's fabulous I love that story that's brilliant um, but you know in all seriousness it is really nice um, that lots of men are coming into the sewing world I mean I'm just about to put a post up on our Instagram feed today actually um, a quilt that I saw yesterday on Instagram and I contacted the chap he's called Scott uh, he does FPP he did the amazing RuPaul piece at the Festival of Quilts and he's just created one called Shadow and it's about being in your shadow self and working through the shadow of your personality um, but it's wonderful um, what he's created um, but it is so nice it's a man you know and and uh, you know obviously you Nicholas and Gary working with Crafty Mongoose Russell who of course takes his sewing hand sewing on trains and was talking in in the previous tea time tutorial about how people sort of look at him strangely but he's never had any issues people are more intrigued by it but I think it's great I think it's it's interesting that the role models so often were grandmas, as you said, Nicholas. Um, but it's interesting now that I think, and it's and it's probably, it's going to be interesting to see how quilting is shaped, because I do feel now that the role models now are our peers. They're not our grandparents and, and people, you know, because we've lost a lot of those skills, I think. Or there's something mm -hmm. happened in the generational gap. So it'll be interesting to see where quilting goes, won't it? Because... It is peers that are that are inspiring other people, like Benjamin, who came on the class with you, Nicholas, to do your cabbage class, never quilted before. Now, just crazy about it and crazy talent. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And also, I mean, it's becoming part of the um, the trend, the interior, you know, the all these lovely quilts and these interior textiles, handmade interior textiles you're seeing in interior magazines and, you know, on, sh um, you know, shoots for um, home and things like that. Well, you'll see them scattered around and, and it's just it is part of it. It's not what was on Granny's bed anymore. This is in a contemporary setting and it looks really, really on trend. So, um, and especially like what Nicholas does, which is much more freer rather than um, something which is much more sort of seriously, well, not serious, but constructed in a very regimented way. It, it takes a time, I think, for things to cycle around. If we look now, currently, you know, quilting is very big. It's gone from utilitarian to the runway we see collections inspired by quilting you know a few years ago um i forget the exact year but one of the met gala themes was the american context or something like that and people wore actual thrifted quilts to yeah. the runway um we see now teenagers younger people wearing uh clothes outer coats made from crocheted granny squares you know yes. very fashionable in in fashion right now and to think of that maybe I don't know, 30 years ago when people were still obviously quilting and crocheting, um, that wouldn't have, you know, probably been imaginable to many people living then that, you know, youth and younger people would want to embrace this very homely craft sense of of, um, of creating. So, yeah, it is nice to see it come a little bit more um, and also kind of get a bit more recognition on the same sort of even footing as other recognised art media. So like painting and sculpture, you know, it's nice to see that it's not just considered craft anymore by um, by both men and women. So yeah, very interesting. Um, so I'm intrigued when you are looking to uh, calm down. Probably when that woman in that shop has done that to you. <laughs> but when you yeah. are, when you are looking for a moment of calm, um, do you? I know that you love your walks and you love nature, so you'll probably say, "Well, I'd go out for a walk." But do you sit down and pick up some sewing and do it as a as a mindful practice, not just that you're preparing for a festival, you're preparing for a class? Is it something you do still just to internally regulate your system? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think stitch and, and quilting is definitely 
an integral part of my life now. I can't imagine sort of a long period of time where I didn't do some form of stitching. Has it changed in the way that it's sort of, um, what it does for me? Yes, absolutely. As you say, very often when I'm sewing or I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm doing things for classes or talks or I'm making samples or I'm making things for the book or I'm always constantly, there's always an end goal or an end idea for that piece that I'm creating. And I was having a conversation with Sarah Hibbert at Festival of Quilts about this very thing. And we both agree that it would be nice to just have a week or so where you could really indulge your creativity for no other reason than having it just be a meditative creative process for you. So no end goal, no deadline, just exploring your own creativity. And that is something, I'll be honest, that I do miss. My days now are very busy with filming and creating and writing. So when I do have a few moments, as you say, generally I'll be outside walking. Um, I love to read, but I do reach for needle and thread. Um, but I try to do something a little bit different that isn't quilting. So quite recently I've began making sort of felt animals um, from the patterns by Cool Crafting. Um, you know, the little lunar lapans. That really sort of takes me out of that quilting mind frame but I still am working with needle and thread and stitch. So I would definitely say that I do use it as a sort of meditative exercise. But if I try to do a quilt that doesn't have any sort of deadline to it, I immediately then, my mind works against me and I start thinking, well, if I'm doing this now, really I should be doing that quilt over there that needs to be sent off for such and such, or I should be writing about that quilt over there which needs to go off for publication or something like that. So there's always an element of guilt, I feel, when I work on quilting things that aren't um, anything specific, they're just explorations. So I try to uh, take my approach of, of uh, stitching and, and thread to a different sort of, slightly different discipline. So sewing these felt creatures, for example, or embroidery or something a little bit different, but still within that realm of, of handwork and, and, and sewing, yeah. But it does show you how passionate you are about it and, you know, and how genuine this is, you know, within you, this kind of creativity running through you. Uh, because as you say, mm. you still choose to sit down and sew, you know, or do do things uh, to, to help you with that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so which is lovely. But to see. It's like Gary said, you know, I never, sorry, I never imagined that it would, you know, it would go to this level um, yeah. of of teaching and writing and traveling the world, essentially, which I've been very fortunate in, you know, that people have shown an interest and they do want to learn this slightly out of the box thinking style. Um, so it's, yeah, it's difficult to escape it. Even when I go for walks and things, I'm looking around, I'm sort of yeah. looking at plants, I'm looking at leaves, I'm looking at the coastline thinking, oh, I could use triangles for that or I could use freehand curves for that. So it's always there. It's constantly there. Um, I don't think it'll ever it'll ever go away entirely. I think I'm, I'm too far in now for it to, to, to go away <laughs> entirely. <laughs> I'm here well, for the long haul. <laughs> well, we don't want it to go away entirely. Uh, and we're already looking at the schedule for 2025 with you on Crafty Monkeys, Nicholas. So it can't go away anywhere yet. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I think we should do our little exercise. Now, it's interesting today because um, you said to me we're going to be manipulating fabric. I've got no idea what that means. I know that you said, that, can you bring a hoop? I don't have a hoop. But actually, that's good because we do try on the channel to give people exercises and they don't need many things. I've just literally grabbed a couple of bits of fabric from a scrap bag I haven't ironed them because I know you'd ever iron your fabrics Nicholas um and I've got no. some and a needle and thread so hopefully everybody can join in so um thank you so much for bringing this to us there you are Nicholas so your hands are now in vision which means you can take it away what are we going to do brilliant so we're going to be doing some fabric manipulation and that is a very broad term so when we think of things like gathering shearing ruffling pin tucks, darts, all of these things are considered fabric manipulation. And the, why you would use fabric manipulation would be um, many different reasons. So in garment construction, you would see fabric manipulation. Um, you would use it to create shape, line, texture. So what I thought we would do is start off with some very simple gathering, uh, using gathers to create fabric manipulation. And, you know, there are lots of different ways that you can approach gathers. But as you said, Rachel, we're going to use just very simple, simple um, equipment. So we have some needles, some thread, 
some scissors and some fabric. And I do have a hoop as well. That's just to sort of add a little bit of tension to the fabric. But it doesn't really matter if you don't have the hoop. I had to this morning when you told me to get a hoop. Can Amazon deliver them in 46 minutes? No. <laughs> I thought you'd have a fully stocked craft cupboard, Rachel. You know, you, you are the, the matriarch of the monkeys now. So I thought you, we'll have to kick you out. We'll have to send you a, a gift basket or something, I think. <laughs> Um, okay, so we're going to be exploring a, a gathering technique called um, furrowing. So we're going to be using some hand stitching just to create wonderful texture. And I have an example here that I'm going to bring in. And this is one that I did um, just, just last night. So you can see that you don't need very uh, specific equipment and it doesn't take a lot of time. So it can be great for if you can just steal away 15 minutes for some mindful sewing. This would be a great example. And I'm going to show you the most basic way, and then I'm going to wrap up by talking about how you could sort of change this. Um, but I've really gotten into flat fabric manipulation recently. Um, I think my ex um, exploration of it started when I made my applique, uh, stuffed applique quilt during COVID 2020. Um, anybody that uh, can look on my Instagram and see that, it's the cover of the new book. And that uses a stuffed applique to create raised elevated shapes. So again, another way, another form of fabric manipulation. But we're going to be working on something like this. So essentially what gathering does is it takes um, the edge of a piece of fabric and it shortens it along a stitch line and it creates mini little folds along that stitching line. Something like this. You can do it even just with your hands to get the idea. So the fabric is shortened along the stitching line and beyond the stitching line, the full extent of the fabric gathers or billows out into these little folds here. And depending on how we treat those folds, we can get different textural um, results. So we are going to start off by taking two pieces of fabric. This white fabric, I'm going to be calling the foundation fabric. So we're going to stitch our um, shape onto that. And this green piece of fabric is what we're going to be cutting our shape from. So the first thing I'd like you both to do is using a pencil, pen, anything you've got to hand. I've just got a disappearing water uh, marker here. Well, actually, this is an air erasable one and a water marker. So anything like that will do. And what I'd like you to do is just draw a rough circle on your um, foundation fabric. So there is no right or wrong size, but because we need, we need to sort of stitch this down, I think something about the size of this, which is about two inches across, would be would be great to start off with. It doesn't have to be a perfect circle. So I'm just roughly drawing something like that. So if I go over that a few times, just so that it picks it up on camera. Again, it doesn't have to be a perfect circle. If you wanted to use a template, an egg cup, a mug, even a saucer, if you were doing quite a large um, sample, that would be great. But all I've done is just draw a freehand circle on this foundation fabric. Now you're going to repeat that on this fabric. And this second piece of fabric is what we're going to be creating the gathers on. So in order to create the texture that having these um, this furrowing creates, we need this piece of fabric, this second piece of fabric, to be bigger. Now, the bigger it is in comparison to this shape, the more furrowing and gathering and texture we'll be able to create. So what I'd now like you to do is draw the same rough size circle, but almost twice as big. Now you don't have to measure, it doesn't have to be that precise. If you just take an eyeball look at your circle here, and then imagine a circle of at least double the size of that and draw it on your piece of fabric. If you had um, circular templates or you wanted to first of all cut out from paper, and make sure that it was double, you can do so, but it doesn't need to be that precise. All we're doing is roughly drawing a circle that's approximately two times the size. Something like that. I'll go over that a few times just so that you can all see it. And essentially the bigger this gathering fabric, the more gathers and furrows and pleats and texture that we can create on this foundation. So once you've got your larger circle drawn, I'm going to cut that out. Now, if I bring in my sim uh, sample before we start to cut that out, you can see that the edge of this is a raw edge. Now, before you begin the furrowing technique, you can, if you wish, finish the edge of this gathered fabric in some way. So 
First of all, let's just go ahead and cut that out on the line. Just, it doesn't have to be perfect. Something like that. And mine's not quite two times the size, but you can see that it is definitely bigger. So what we're now going to do is gather the edge of this fabric along a stitched line. And remember I said that whenever you gather, essentially what you're doing is shortening the edge of that fabric. So you're taking something that's oversized and you're making it smaller. And on that stitching line will create little sort of bunches of fabric, little folds of fabric. But I mentioned that we could finish the edge of this first of all. So some examples of how to do that might include just turning under a seam allowance before you begin the gathers. You could use pinking shears to cut your circle out. And what pinking shears do is they just give you a nice little zigzag edge to stop fraying. But of course, there's nothing wrong with having the raw edge and have it frayed. And it now would be a good time to sort of talk about roughly what you might use this for. So you could create a little textile piece inspired by plants or flowers. These could be the center of flowers. They could be stones. They could be coral. Um, so coupled with some other fabric manipulation techniques, this is a great way to create sort of a, a small art piece or a nice wall hanging with lots and lots of texture. So if having a frayed edge really appeals to you, it creates a different type of texture in itself, then you don't have to finish the edge. So that's what I'm going to do with this one. I'm just going to leave a raw edge. But of course, if you did this again, you could, as I said, fold under a little bit of a, a seam allowance underneath. So you have a non-raw edge. You could use your pinking shears. You could even zigzag or overlock this edge um, if you wanted to. And then we would just do our gathering stitching in a little bit more. But now we've got our two pieces of fabric prepped. We're going to take a needle and thread it up. And I favor a slightly longer needle. If I show you that on my hand, it's a little bit bent. It's been uh, used quite a lot. But what a longer needle will allow me to do is load more of the fabric onto it. And you'll see what I mean by that in a second. So this is just standard 50 weight. I'm using more of 50 weight, but any, any thread. And normally I would color match to whatever fabric I'm using for the shape. But because I wanted to give you the best opportunity to see it on camera, I've gone for black <laughs> against the green. So we're just gonna go ahead and thread this needle. Always pressure on when you're trying to uh, thread the needle live or on, on camera. And then you're just going to knot the end. I'm just gonna do a simple quilt as knot, but any knot that you like, so that you have a nice long thread and I'm a little bit naughty. This thread is very long as you can see. Now, what I was told when um, I began sewing and things that the thread should be the distance from your wrist to your elbow and that really stops it from knotting but I'm very impatient so I like a slightly longer thread. So we're gonna move this out of the way and we're gonna pick up our circle and we're going to go about an eighth of an inch in, somewhere between an eighth and a quarter of an inch in. And we're going to do a running stitch. And we're not going to go up, then down, then up, then down, because that will take quite a while. So what I like to do is load stitches onto the needle. So just go up on the edge like so and bring your knot to the back so that you have that. And then by loading the needle, what I mean is just putting the needle in, going about an eighth of an inch out and then back in again and out. So if I try and show you that first of all, I've got two stitches loaded on that needle there. So if you're using a slightly longer needle, you can then carry on and go all the way around, really putting lots of little mini folds onto your needle. And once you get a fair few on there, what you then do is pull the needle through, but not too tight, just until it sits on the surface of the fabric and you have something that looks like that. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six stitches along the edge of that fabric now. And we're gonna work our way all the way around until we get to the other side. 
And don't be afraid to really load up that needle. You can put as many, you could probably get about halfway around if you just keep pushing that fabric onto the needle. Don't worry about what's happening here. That's all fine. Load up that needle. Once you've got a fair few on there, <coughs> pull it through. If you've ever made jam, I remember making jam as a child as well with my nan. Um, and you would have those sort of fabric tops that covered the jam jar. It's the same sort of approach here. So you're just creating a stitching line around the edge, which is shortening that edge of fabric through the creation of little folds. So I'm about halfway round now. So I'm going to keep going, just loading up this needle and pulling through. Nicholas, is your your, then, nan, your nan is sadly departed, isn't she? She's not with us anymore. Yes, yeah, she was. Um, she got to ninety one, which is a ripe old age. Yeah. And unfortunately, she yeah, she passed away in um, twenty uh, twenty. Yeah. Just sorry, no, two thousand nineteen. I beg your pardon. Just before the publication of my first book, which was actually oh. um, dedicated to her, obviously. Um, whilst I was writing it, I knew that I wanted it to be dedicated to her because she was such a, you know, a creative force in my life. But unfortunately, she didn't get to to actually see it. But um, yeah, she's she's obviously, I think, still a huge part of my life. And any time I do any creativity, even when I just thread a needle, even just doing it now with you guys, it does. It, it takes me back and um, yeah. just reminds me that, you know, she was that real creative influence in my life. So. But she knew you were writing a book and everything. I yes, think. she yeah. did. Yeah. So she knew of the book. And um, it was a shame because she died in the January and the book was published in April. So um, I did actually, you know, when when she was um, near the end, I did actually read the passage out to her. So, um, yeah, she didn't actually get to see it herself. But I know that she's somewhere and looking and, uh, you know, very uh, proud, I would like to imagine. She absolutely yeah. is. She absolutely is. And I'm sure, you know, the great thing is that at least she did get to see, you know, the fact that you were writing a book, you were making a career out of it, and she knew the influence she'd had on you. So that's lovely. That's yeah. Really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I've gotten all the way around to the end now. And the next thing I'd like you to do is you can see how this has already started to get some shape to it. So just to recap, we've done a run-in stitch all the way around the edge. And now we can pull this thread very gently. And can you see how those gathers start to appear? So that edge of fabric is being made shorter along the stitching line. And and Gary will be very familiar with this. This gathering in yeah. dressmaking, you know. This is, uh, this setting is in. the sleeve head, isn't it? This is putting yes. the sleeve head in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, you know, lots of uses to, to be able to do gathering. And yeah. my preference is to do it by hand. As we know, it's very meditative. It's portable. But, of course, you can do it on the machine as well with double rows of stitching, all sorts of things. So once you have your um, gathering stitches in place, you're going to very gently pull. And the aim of it is to get the diameter or sorry, the circumference rather of this circle to match the circumference of the circle that you drew on Ooh. your piece of paper, uh, fabric, not paper. I'm going to go over mine again because it's, um, it's a little bit light. So I just want to make sure that you can see it. So as you guys are stitching away. There we go. So all we're going to do is just very gently pull the gathers and they'll start to gather at one end. So what you may need to do is pull a little bit, hold the thread in your oh. thumb and finger, and then move the gathers along a little bit. So pull, move the gathers along. And every now and then, just have a little look. Slides it up. It's slight, yeah, exactly, slides it along. And it doesn't have to be perfect. You're never going to get an exact match because this is going to be a roughly waved edge. So you just want it so that it's roughly the same size as that circle that you that you drew. So just gently pull the thread, slide the stitches along so that they're even, and then just keep checking it against the circle that you drew on your foundation fabric. And once it's roughly the same size, just pop it on top 
and take a little look. So I'm almost there. I could actually maybe take a few. If you've gone too small, all you need to do is just loosen the tension on those stitches a little bit and that will release some of those gathers. But I'm pretty much there, I think. So just to stop those gathers from moving anymore, just take a few stitches on the edge in the same place, just to sort of hold those gathers in place so that they don't go any further, like so. So you'll have something that um, kind of resembles a shower cap, which it is does. not what we're making. Say, I was just gonna say, <laughs> it resembles a shower hat. Which is something shower cap for mice. I use this a shower cap for my lunar lap. Yeah. Maybe this is <laughs> this is something that um, could be an idea. Okay, so once you've got your everybody okay so far, we all yeah. doing okay. Yeah, good, good. yeah. So what I'd like you now to do is place your gathered section onto that um, shape that you drew, your circle that you drew on your foundation fabric. And this is the fiddliest part, and it doesn't have to be perfectly neat, and it would be neater if you'd finished the edges, but I quite like the rough and ready edges. So I just want you now to applique the edge of this down to that line. So the easiest way I find to do it is to pick up the two pieces, like so, align the edge of, and I just use the same thread. Now, if you were worried that this thread was going to snap, and sort of undo all of your gathers. You could re-thread a new needle, but for the purposes of this demonstration, I'm just going to use the thread that I've got. And because it's black, hopefully it will show up. So I've got my gathered fabric here. There's the line that I've drawn. I'm offering up the two there so that they match. And I'm just taking a few stitches through. And I'm gonna do quite large over the edge stitches. I'm not going to try and do an invisible applique stitch because I want you just to be able to see it. So all I'm doing is going through the gathered fabric, through the foundation fabric and back out, taking a few stitches. So on the back, can you see how I've taken two stitches? So the aim of the, um, of the exercise is to stitch now this shape to the circle that you've drawn. It's gonna feel a little bit awkward because you've got this bulbous fabric rising up in the middle. But if you take a few stitches at a time, keep just lining up and working your way around, you'll get quicker and more confident with the more stitches that you, that you do. So just following all the way around. It gets easier once you've got anchor down and you've got a few sides, yes. then then it seems to be easier then. It's just getting it started. Exactly, yeah. Once you, as you say, anchored, it holds it in place yeah. and it doesn't really like uh, fall or anything then. It, it doesn't want to move. And if you're finding that you're not exactly meeting the drawn line, please don't worry. That drawn line, think of that drawn line as just as a sort of guide. It's just a suggestion of a shape. And I told you to draw circles. It could be an oval, it could be a blob, um, any sort of organic shape that you like just follow it and you can see here that i haven't quite matched the line but that's absolutely fine we're just going to keep working our way around and like anything you know the first time you do it i remember the first time i made some of the applique shapes for my temperature quilt it was very awkward um, but once you've done 365 of them then <laughs> you're an it gets, expert <laughs> it gets easy you're an expert <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, so we should just... Well, exactly the same. Go on, go on, Gary. I was going to say, it is you start something, oh, this is a great idea, and then you think, my God, I've got to either film this, photograph this, or teach other people how to do this, and I'm struggling <laughs> myself, you know? Yeah, it was really hard with the Steph's applique, because the Steph's applique um, is, is in the new book, Use and Ornament, and it's... You know, it's it's an, an age old technique. There's examples of, you know, raised applique and raised quilting um, in, in centuries old quilts. But what's happened now is that people have kind of embraced a, a quicker cheater's way, if you like. Although cheat is not the right word, but a sort of mechanically aided way whereby you quilt in using uh, dissolvable threads and extra layers of wadding and then cut away to give the idea of trapunto or faux oh, trapunto. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I've gone back old school with the temperature quilt to just sort of um, really do it as, it as it would have been done by making a slit in the foundation fabric and then putting the, the wadding yeah. or the, the, the polyfill in from the back. So going in behind. it is very, you know, very meditative and 
great for sort of sitting in front of the TV, um, as, as is this, you know, it doesn't require a lot of concentration. If your stitch is not quite perfectly aligned, it doesn't matter, you know, we're not making a traditional quilt where we have to kind of pay attention to measurements and things. So this is, um, this really sort of is escapism for me. I'll never forget. And a hand sewing like this, it's great. You could have the radio on, you could have some music on, you could listen to an audio book or something like that. I do think, you know, it's a lovely thing to do with your hands, but also your other senses could be used, you know, like your hearing and stuff. You could be doing something else at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 I often, um, I speak to some people who have silence when they quilt, but I really enjoy listening to music. I think it kind of gives me a rhythm depending on, you know, if, if it's slow meditative, then, you know, a bit of classical or something with a, with a slower pace. If I'm free motion quilting, I find sort of faster uh, music will really help me get into a rhythm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. music in the sewing room is, is really nice. It's like so I have like reached... Music. Oh, go on. Sorry, Rachel. I was going to say, it's like, it's like music with exercise, isn't it? People like to listen to music when they exercise, and it, and it does actually help them to exercise you know, faster or better or whatever. So I get, I get yes. music while you're sewing. Absolutely gets you in, the, you know, like you say, you can listen to different, if you're, if you want to kind of really, I know it's not a sound a bit strange, but if you're using your machine and you're needing to do something that's quite quick, you know, well, then you're probably going to put some faster music on, but then some hand sewing like this, you might have some really calming, gentle music on. So yeah, I get that. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely. It depends on that, what, that mood you're going for, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I've gotten all the way around. So all I'm doing now is taking a stitch on the back, going through the stitch just to secure that applique down. And you result in something that looks like this. And obviously you could take a little bit more time, make your stitches a little bit more even, but you get the idea that we've now appliqued that piece of fabric down to this piece of fabric. So all of this billowing is exactly what we want because we've shortened the fabric along the edge. We've converted the edge into mini folds bunched along that stitching line and everything else, all of that other fabric's got nowhere else to go other than upwards like this. So once you've got something like that, we are good to go. Well done. Everyone okay? Yes. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. So for those of us that have a hoop, <laughs> we, will now so i've cut my thread and we can use the same thread for the next stage normally as i said i would color match but i'm gonna go with the black and I'll just knot it again pop that in my pin cushion for a moment and gary rachel if you just bear with because what gary and i are going to do now is just hoop this and you want to hoop if you're working on a small piece I, and i found this work very well with my stuffed applique shapes as well it's far easier to manipulate and, and, and maneuver a, a hoop that's relatively sized to what you're sewing. So if you're doing a massive piece, obviously you need a slightly bigger hoop, but if you have a smaller piece, try and find a smaller sized hoop because it's just easier to hold then. If you don't have a hoop, it's not a big deal. You can still do the furrowing technique, but by having the hoop, it's just gonna put it under a little bit of tension and just give you something to grip that isn't the fabric really. So just pop that in. And this is nothing special, it's just, a, you know, your standard wooden embroidery hoop. So I'm just pulling that through and you want a really nice sort of drum-like tautness on that then. And then tighten up the screw, pull it through a little bit more so that you have something that looks like that. Oh. Sorry. So that you have something that looks like that. Okay, yeah. so I've just hooped the piece like this. And as I said, if you don't have a hoop, it's, it's fine. This just gives you something to hold on to. So now what we're gonna do is the interesting part, the real, uh, the part that's really gonna bring this to life. So we're gonna take our needle again and knot it if you haven't already. And we're gonna go through the back foundation fabric right in the middle, just push that needle right through. And you're gonna come up and aim to go right in the middle of that fabric. So can you see my needle comes through from the back? I just move that edge out. So it goes into the back, comes through the two layers and out of the middle. Now, when you're drawing your shapes and transferring your um, circle onto the two types of fabric, 
you can actually put a reference dot in the middle of each, if you like, just so that you know that's roughly the middle, because obviously, as you can see, this becomes distorted. So it can sometimes be hard to know where the middle was. It's not an absolute essential, but it just helps you to sort of get the middle. And my knot wasn't big enough there. So I'm just going to do another slightly stronger knot. So you don't want that thread to come all the way through as mine just did. So a slightly bigger knot, cut off the old one, going back through the fabric there and through the middle of that little shower cap, like so. And then you're going to take a stitch that's about a millimetre or so away from where you came out and go back down and force that fabric down and come out on the other side, quite close to where you came out originally, and pull that taut. And as you pull that taut, it will pull that gathered fabric down to the foundation. Now, if you let go of your thread, it will somewhat bounce back up. So what we now want to do is go back in again through the same hole or thereabouts. So it doesn't have to be the exact same hole, but just a thread's width away maybe and aim to come back up on top of the stitch that you took first of all, pull it through, and then once again, go down into roughly the same. So you're essentially taking two stitches on top of each other to secure that down and pull it taut. And then when you let it go, it should kind of stay down then. It won't want to sort of raise back up. That's really nice. Something? I like that. Yeah. I like it almost looks, you know, the little anemones, those um, jelly anemone, anemones that you get stuck yes. on the rocks. From the, it looks like that. Look yeah. And that's what I said. Um, remember, I said, you know, I, I have images. I've always wanted to do something based on coral. Yeah. And I think using um, stuffed applique, um, this sort of furrowing, other sorts of gathers, um, maybe some shearing as well on the machine, you could create wonderful texture. Right. If you then chose really nice, um, vibrant fabrics that sort of represented coral, maybe like a ditzy print, something like a spot or a, a very fine sort of meander or something, I think you could make a really, really nice wall hanging or art yeah. piece. Just rather than focusing on piecing a fabric and seams, more so focused on this idea of manipulating it to create texture. Yeah. And what we're doing here today is just very much the tip of, you know, the iceberg. There's lots to be explored with, not only just within gathering, but also all of those other uh, manipulating techniques we talked about. So once we have our first stitch, what we're then going to do is jump. So we're going to, and th there's no rhyme or reason to this. If you wanted, as I said, to put a dot in the middle, in the same way you could put reference dots around just to give you somewhere to jump to. But Part of the fun for me is just traveling. And I travel about half an inch, give or take, come up through the gathering fabric again, a stitch of about two mil, go back down and try to come out where you came out on the back and then repeat that. So you're always taking two stitches to secure it because if you don't I find that it likes to raise up so always try and get your stitches to sit on top of each other it's going to be hard because as you push back up through the needle so too this raises but the more you stitch this the firmer it will be held down so don't worry too much if it's not bang on top <clears throat> but just back down so that you have something that looks like that on the back. So there's the knot where I came out. There's my, sorry, that's just cool. Let's just move, there we go. So there's the knot where I came out. There's my first stitch. I jumped to there and I've now taken two stitches. So I'm gonna jump again, maybe over here, come up through the gathering fabric, pull it taut and go back down, coming out roughly in the same place. So what I'd like you now to do is just work your way across the piece, traveling, taking a few stitches in the same place and then traveling again. And this is where you can decide how much furrowing or texture you want to create. Obviously the fewer stitches you take, 
the more raised up this will appear. If I bring in my sample, you can see the difference hopefully between those two. This one's peaks and valleys are much taller, maybe if I show you on the side. And this one, where you stitched it down a lot more, if I show you the back, it is white on white, so maybe you won't be able to see it as clearly, but you can see the density of stitch that I've done there to create these little furrows. So let's just do a few more. My needle's coming and thread it, so I'm just gonna thread that. But I do find a longer needle is a little bit more easier to use than something like a sharp or a shorter needle. So traveling, coming out and going back down. And as you probably found with applicating the shape on, the more of these little bites of the fabric that you do, the quicker you will get and the easier it will become. But this is really for you to just explore the texture that you're trying to create. So I can't tell you exactly where to stitch. The idea is that you just jump around. And as you get more stitches into the piece, as you've seen, it will flatten. So what you can then do is when you're on the right side of the piece, so if I just secure this last one, I'm going to travel over to here, you can start to use the needle tip to sort of suggest the furrows that you want to make, these little meandering um, lines. It's almost going to become like a maze, like a labyrinth of pleats and gathers. So going back down, roughly where I came out, and taking two stitches in the same place to pull that down. I'm definitely absorbed in this. I've got, as Rachel said, you've gone quiet, Gary, and I have because I'm now <laughs> I'm completely in the zone and just looking and thinking about where I'm putting the needle. I'm not worrying about anything else. I'm just, it's lovely. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's so because the placement of each stitch will create a different effect. If you think yes. about piecing a quilt block let's say, and we're sewing a square to a square and we're just sewing a straight stitch. Each of those stitches is exactly the same. So normally what we'll find is that we put our, floor, uh, our foot to the pedal and just run through that stitch, don't we? We, we know yeah. that it's just a straight stitch. But this, each slight change in direction or size will have a different effect on the look of the finished piece. So it's like you said, Gary, you're really sort of thinking about each stitch where you're going to go to next do you want to maybe leave that a little bit raised or do yeah. you want to go in and flatten it down with stitch it is it's a very sort of meditative thought-provoking process i think and very organic this is so organic it, uh, it evolves and you know unless you're it, for someone that's a control freak if you want to, it to be all exactly where you want it to be you're gonna it's not going to work for you because you've just got to go with we, as we said at the beginning, go with the flow. Just let it exactly. evolve. Yeah. Um, no, I'm really liking this. It's lovely. I suppose, so once you've sort of like got round, if I find a bit that's sort of, if it's bothering me, it's too much for Pete, can I just then take control a little bit and put a little bit of a, a little stitch yeah. in there perhaps and do Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so like here on mine, for example, this, this quite yeah, large yeah. Yeah. raised bit, I might think, actually, no, I want to flatten that down. So I can travel all the way over to there, go right in the middle of that. There it is there, raised. If I go back down, roughly where I came out and pull that down, can you see how it's changed yeah. that now? Yeah. Completely, yeah. it's taking it, yeah. taking it down. So I'm happy with that. So I'm going to go back up, take that double stitch to secure it. And now with that done, that section there, what was once a sort of raised element here has now been pulled in to, to meet the, the, the flatness of the foundation fabric. So you can absolutely just see how you feel, make changes, jump across. And I quite like, as I said, to use the tip of my needle to push the fabric where I want it to go and then stitch it down to create, you know, specific ridges or, or valleys and peaks. And Part of mm. me, I mean, I don't dislike seeing the little tiny stitches, 
um, you have to look quite hard to find them. And I'm using black on green. Obviously, if you colour match your, your fabric yes. to your thread, then you won't see those little anchoring stitches. But you could use those anchoring stitches as a creative choice. You know, you could use a contrasting thread because you want it to be seen. You could use a slightly thicker thread um, for this part. So I would still use a sort of 50 weight standard weight for the gathering stitch along the edge. But if you wanted to then do the furrowing in a heavier weight thread, that could be quite interesting. Add another layer of texture. You could use French knots or something like that to pull and secure. That's it what I was just be... thinking that, that you, you could yeah. um, have almost like, it could look like little seeds or little things in amongst the little tucks and that, that you could put a French knot in there or, or a stitch that gave some another dimension to it. It could look absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. Really nice. Or how about, you know, threading as you're doing these stitches before you put your needle back in, thread a little seed bead or a bugle yes. bead or something on there. Again, we're, we're sort of thinking what this could be. Um, it could be representative of shells. It could be rocks. It could be um, an enemy, sea creatures, coral, as, as we discussed. So lots of possibilities for for using this and if you were thinking that you wanted it to be something specific or something specifically shaped then of course you could draw that shape onto the foundation fabric it doesn't have to be doesn't have to be a circle at all it can be whatever whatever you want it to be so i'm just working my way across and i think i'll do a few more but i'm actually quite I quite like having some of the taller folds sticking up as well as as well as the sort of shallower ones maybe one there Yeah, I'm quite happy with that. So you would carry on until you, you are at a level of furrowing that, that you like. And there are two things that will change how the, the or two main things that will change how the furrowing looks. And that is the ratio of furrowing or gathering fabric to the foundation fabric. Remember, I said about twice the size, but if you go bigger, you'll have more fabric to work with. If you go this, uh, only ever so slightly bigger you won't have as much fabric to work with so you won't get as much texture but also the density of of the stitch so if i show you the back i've done a fair amount mm. of stitching but compared to the one that i made yesterday there's a lot more on this so for that reason the furrows have become much more meandering much tighter um, when compared to this slightly more open one so you would carry on until you are happy with the amount that you have. And then what I would then do is just take a stitch on the back, just through the foundation fabric, a little bit tricky with a slightly longer needle, but just taking a stitch like so, and then going through that stitch just to create a nice little knot, a nice little anchoring point. Trim off those threads. And there we have our lovely gathered piece. And you can see that the edge is starting to fray a little bit. But of course, as we mentioned, you could um, do an edge finishing treatment to that. So pinking shears, fold it under. If you did want to fold it under, I would fold it under first, perhaps with the use of a, an iron to help you. And then I would run the gathering stitch through that double layer um, of fabric. It'll still pull in, it'll still come together, even though it's not on a single layer. You just might have to pull it a little bit harder. But what you'll then be left with is when you applique the shape down, you won't have the raw edge. And if you did go as far as to finish those edges by folding them under, you could do a sort of blind, uh, sort of slip stitch then on the edge so that you didn't see the stitching, um, the applique stitching that holds this to this. But what I generally did, because I have the raw edge, I just went for a much longer running stitch. Um, so you've got two rows of stitching here. One is the gathering stitch, one is the running stitch. Once 
it was appliqued down. You could, if you wanted to, take the gathering stitches out. Just be very careful that you are taking out the right stitch. But I quite like having the, the row of stitches along the outside edge anyway. But that is something that you could you could experiment with and decide if you wanted to, to take those gathering stitches out or not. Um, another thing that you could do, rather than hand stitching the gathering fabric to the foundation, you could use a machine for that. So you would gather the edge in the in the way that I showed you on the on the long needle, loading your stitches, pulling that to meet the same size shape as the foundation fabric, and then very carefully um, stitching around using a machine. It might be a little bit awkward at points, but you could definitely get um, either just a straight stitch. You could do a dead zigzag like a, stat, a satin stitch. So that in turn could take care of the raw edge as well. If you've got a lot of folds on the edge, just remember to, to slow down a little bit, but a dense zigzag would cover that. And that would then anchor the gathering fabric to the foundation fabric in a slightly different way and give you a slightly different look. And then as for the furrowing, it would be the same then. You would do exactly the same. But I think it's, um, you know, it's a really nice technique. It's a, just a, a gentle introduction to gathers mm. um, to give sort of these, what we're calling flattened shower caps, I think, is the <laughs> word of the day, what we're going with here. <laughs> term, the flattened shower cap. I love it. The flattened. Like, you, inspiration comes from everywhere. So, you know, I can definitely see lots of these, um, you know, being very effective, useful in creating a textural piece inspired by all sorts of things. But I'm particularly excited to combine it. So perhaps with more... Um, fabric manipulation. So, as I said, stuffed applique, you could do pleats, you could do pin tucks, um, shearing, quilting, you know, lots of things combined to suggest natural shapes and textures. I think this is best suited to. So, yes, that is furrowing and gathering. Wow. Well, <laughs> I think it's time to reveal our work to you, Gary. To the mass. I'm very excited. Yeah. <laughs> I've I been so concentrated our, on my own work. I know, I know how our monkeys feel now. It's quite nerve wracking showing Nicholas Ball your work. <laughs> so to replace, first of all, this is Gary. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I, um, I have used black thread because I just like, like you say, then you can really see, I think actually for practicing the first time, it might be a good idea because you can see how, where your stitches are and it's good for a reference. And then once yeah. you've done your sample one, then you can do color matching. Yeah. But no, I love this. I did manage to just um, needle turn all first before I gathered up. So um, to combat that rough, that raw edge. Um, yeah. But no, I, I love it. I absolutely love that. Um, in fact, in a minute, I've, I've, I just cut out some petal shapes and just a walk your petals round it or yeah. you know what does this become yeah. um and again shades of the color that you're using are the shades of pink and ones with ditzy prints on and that start clustering them together and that could create such a nice sort of like organic feel to it so i don't know what i'd turn it into but it's definitely something i'm going to put into my um my little uh, books of stitches i'm going to add Wonderful. that to it no, yes. thank very, you. Very, very effective. Yeah, that looks awesome. Fabulous. <laughs> right, thank I already have mine now. Can we approve right. it? Just have a look. I've only been sewing roll. for a couple of months. Can we just appreciate this? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> She's coming in. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, lovely. Yes. That's all right. Yeah. Very nice. I'm shocked. I've actually and that, we've... you didn't have a hoop or anything for that. No, no, you were you were up against it without your hoop, but you've done very well. Very, yeah, very impressed with that. I, you, I can hear Nicholas that you're actually quite amazed that I've managed to do. That. <laughs> Not amazed. Of course, no, you, I, you know, I, I expected nothing less. I knew that you would be able to achieve such wonderful things, um, but I'm just, yeah, it's 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 very very good. Well done. <laughs> Well, I have to say, you know, let, let's bring us back into vision now. Let's bring us back. OK, so. Um, well, I have to say, Nicholas, um, once again, I mean, lovely exercise. I barely spoke through that because I really was, um, you know, in the process and I was trying to, you know, work out where my folds went. I am quite a control freak. I mean, you and I, Nicholas, we're very similar. We're very similar in so many ways. And I am quite I was like, oh, you know, wanting to get all the folds 
perfect really but that's not the idea of it you're just sewing getting in the frame of mind and and Gary really did that and you've seen with Gary's um I didn't get that many gathers out of mine and yet I'm I did quite a big circle so I'd, I'd like to have a go again so I really enjoyed it and it's definitely going to go on the wall of fame hey. <gasps> Wow. I know. It's going Made in the it. gallery, Nicholas. It's going in the gallery. The gallery of Kim. And... <laughs> but no, that was absolutely lovely. So, Nicholas, I really do appreciate your time you've taken with us today. If anybody is watching today, please do always keep an eye on our website, craftymonkeys.com, because Nicholas teaches regularly with us. In fact, if you're watching this um, episode before November the 25th, um, there is a live class with Nicholas coming up and he's going to be teaching a foliage quilt. You're actually going to make a topper with these beautiful leaves um, and that will be a three hour class. So do make sure you check that out on the website. Um, and as I say, he's always doing things with us and he's on our retreats. Look out for Nicholas's new book coming out. Do we have a date yet for the entrance to the world? End of next month. Allegedly. This, well, let's just, let's just cover all bases and say, it will be released in 2023. That's, there we go. And then I, I won't get angry letters then, you know, no. I won't get complaints. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 2023 is the new book, but the first book is available now. Um, get it on Amazon. The new book is called Use and Ornament. And the previous book, Inspiring Improv, uh, that's Nicholas's first book. I'll put the links in the description below so you could just uh, click through and, uh, and have a look at those. Thank you so much, Nicholas. That has been a glorious way this morning. And thank you to Gary. It's been interesting to see the two of you interacting <laughs> as um, two male sewers. It's a thing. It's a thing. <laughs> Okay, lovely YouTuber. We'll see you next time. Please give us a thumbs up on your way out of the door. We would really appreciate it. And we will see you for another Tea Time tutorial. What will it be? Who will it be? Let's come and find out. Bye. Bye. <laughs>